Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry, a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, everybody, today we're heading back to Kraut's channel, and I've covered something, I think like three or so um, of Kraut's videos. But every time I've done one, people have come back and said, what you actually need to be covering is this video, which is called Why Saudi Arabia is Doomed. So I'm wondering why people are kind of recommending this topic. I mean, something against Saudi Arabia, and it has an amazing history. Um, but yeah, I guess why it's doomed is something I guess we should be checking out. All right, the original video link is down below. Make sure to support that. So you can support Kraut, who has been a great sport in allowing me to comment on his videos. All right, let's check this out. All right, here we go. History does not repeat. Struck. In 1483, the Portuguese explorer Diogo Chao landed at the mouth of the Congo River and claimed the lands around it for Portugal. He then sailed up the River Congo and realized there was a problem with his claim. These lands were already inhabited by a people living within a structured and well-functioning state, a kingdom with a capital called Mbanza that already had a population of 60,000 and was therefore just as large as Lisbon. This was the first contact between Europeans and the Kingdom of Bakongo, or the Congo Kingdom. I wanted to set up some context here. So here in the mid 1400s, a lot of people jump right to um, like Vasco da Gama or Christopher Columbus when you talk about, um, uh, you know, uh, European explorers. But you really need to start with Portugal um, early on, earlier on with uh, Henry the Navigator, who really kind of, they believe, kind of set and kind of set up the age of exploration. So he was a Portuguese noble who was the first European to really, I guess, explore and map out uh, Western Africa. And that kind of set the stage because then later on you get like Bartolomeu Diaz, who then was the first to uh, European to sail all the way to the southern tip of Africa and Vasco da Gama later on. So yeah, this had been going on for the Portuguese. Um, they're looking for new trade routes and new access points, especially since the fall of Constantinople, which um, that then pushed it even further. So you could get more access to Asian goods. Diogo sent four of his crew to be ambassadors to the king of the Congo to and took to four Congolese with him back to Portugal to serve as the Congo king's ambassadors to the king of Portugal. A year later, and 590 miles to the north of the Congo estuary, another Let's Portuguese, Alvaro Camina, built a Portuguese settlement on the island of Sao Tomé, just off the coast of the Gold Coast. By the way, just real quick, um, the Portuguese were not very successful, though, at like conquering inland. They didn't have the military power to necessarily... And you could see why, like they're saying, these are massive African states. But what they usually did was set up ports near coastal areas and kind of operated from there. Sao Tome had no native peoples. The first use of the island was as a sort of prison colony for people expelled from Portugal for being deemed as undesirable, Just like Portuguese Jews. Being a volcanic island, the soils were fertile and conducive Part for the, the growth and harvesting of cash crops, primarily sugar. And it is here where the history of the Congo and the history of Portugal cross paths to change the world with two innovations. Um, sugar the was the most profitable of all these cash crops. Why Europeans love to do it in places like Africa um, or like uh, Americas was because the climate needs a tropical climate for sugar. And Europe doesn't do that very well. Well, it doesn't do it at all. Portuguese invented the plantation on Sao Tomé. Vast networks of cash crops run by a central processing structure to Slaves. maximize output through the use of monocultures and the abuse of forced labor. But there was a problem. The first forced laborers were expelled Jewish children who died. And at one point, Portugal ran out of Jews and others it considered undesirable to be forced onto Sao Tome plantations. So they started sailing the coast of West Africa, kidnapping Africans from coastal villages and forcing those to work. And it was there where the Kingdom of Congo contributed its own innovation. It went on war raids deep into Africa, kidnapped men, women, and children, and sold them to the Portuguese. Yeah, so this, this ends up being kind of thing. I mean, like I was saying earlier, the Portuguese don't have really the military power to go into these foreign lands. But at first, they would go and obtain those slaves um, kind of themselves. Now, that was a very difficult process to do. And... Um, and also expensive. So you're going to see how it's going to be mutually beneficial for some of these African states and the European states is let the other powerful African states basically do those attacks and gather those, those slaves and, and those attacks and then just sell them to the Portuguese. Mutually beneficial. And of course, it's going to be a main feature 
of the Atlantic slave trade completely because eventually these slaves, once after Columbus's voyages, are going to start heading to uh, to the Americas, thus bringing in the triangular trade network that everyone you know, used to and hearing about. This is where the transatlantic slave trade was born before it actually became transatlantic. The model of running sugar plantations with African slaves was such an incredibly profitable venture that the Portuguese copied it in Especially their South American colonies where the Spaniards copied sugar them and eventually everyone um, copied the Spaniards. The thing. Portuguese may have had to share the slave plantation economy and concept with others, but there's one thing they retained control of, the slave trade. Well not entirely on their own. The Congolese king but converted largely. to Catholic... Um, the most slaves coming out of the of Africa um, went to uh, the Caribbean and Brazil. And Brazil being Portuguese controlled made Portugal basically the largest of the slave traders. For a time at least. Christianity, but his relationship with the Portuguese was a little strenuous. He refused yeah. to abandon polygamy as the Portuguese missionaries demanded, and also refused to change the political structure of the Congo, which was a kingdom in which an aristocracy elected a king from the aristocrats into a hereditary monarchy that the missionaries wanted. When the yeah, so so you know, polygamy had been um, a common feature amongst a lot of different different African tribes and cultural groups for a long. time. And with the Congo, um, you know, they, they have this, this conversion, okay, by their monarchy and later into the people. And one benefit of doing that was supposed to be that the Portuguese wouldn't directly enslave those African states that had converted to Christianity. And one of the hot points was that some Portuguese slave traders did that because, um, again, it's obviously more profitable if you can get the slaves yourselves and not have to buy them. Um, so some of these slave traders are like, well, I don't really care what the deal was made between the Portuguese monarchy and the African, you know, any African monarch. So you still had these instances of them doing them, them, them that themselves. And these African nations, like these African uh, Christian kings would, you know, send these letters pleading Portuguese kings saying, hey, you got to do something. Your people are coming in and enslaving our people. We're supposed to be you know, like brothers. And that caused, again, a lot of animosity. But it really, it, as you notice, hopefully you notice here, it really comes down to one thing with all of this, especially with the Portuguese. It's about money. It's about money here. More than anything else. King died. One of his sons seized the throne through the help of his mother and the civil war. He converted the kingdom to Catholicism. Still However, know he continued to, to clash with, with the Portuguese over the slave trade, which he believed should be entirely controlled by the Congo Kingdom, and was angered by Portuguese slave raids in his kingdom. He wanted a slave trade monopoly. Two kings later, by the 1550s, the Congo Kingdom became an absolute hereditary monarchy and formulated a military alliance and economic alliance with the Portuguese. The Congo kings would conduct raids in Africa to capture Africans, transport them to the coast, and sell them to the Portuguese slave traders, while the Portuguese would militarily assist the Congo Kingdom in its slave raids, but not go on raids to kidnap Africans themselves. Because if you're wondering what the triangular uh, triangular trade network, right? You got Europe, you got Africa, and you got the Americas as a point. So a question would, might be for you, what are the Africans getting out of it, right? So there's money and stuff. One of the big things is um, guns, okay? Uh, European weaponry. And this was especially, you know, enticing for the Europeans because it's like, hey, we're going we're gonna, to uh, sell them these guns and it's going to help us because those guns are literally going to be used to enslave other people so it's, it was like investing, like an inv investing there in Africa. Um, but it, this was so tumultuous for Africa, West Africa, because it's, it almost seemed like with these different African nations, it was like you weren't participating in the slave trade. You were still could be a victim of it. So it's like, he, it's like either be slavers or be enslaved. And some of these economies, you know, they, the African economies like, you know, did well with it. But they also became dependent on it. And you'll see like later on when the years of slavery and, and you start to get abolition movements in like the 1800s and stuff, um, without that huge part of their economy, it's a lot of African, you know, those ones that weren't depleted because they had been, you know, defeated in warfare so many times for um, acquiring slaves, but their economies collapsed because they had become so dependent economically on the Europeans that that also will create 
chaos in those countries. So it's like in the end, none of these African nations are going to win. This was the beginning of one of the most lucrative trade agreements in human history. For almost two more centuries, the Portuguese <laughs> and very Congo good kings here. would continue to hold almost a complete monopoly on the transatlantic slave trade. The Spaniards, the Dutch, the French, and the British may all run slave plantations, but it was the Portuguese who shipped the slaves and from who you had to buy. And the Portuguese in turn bought most of their slaves from the Congo kings. The plantation economy of the New World became the foundation upon which the first globalized economy was built, and the fuel burnt to keep it running were African human beings. The wealth yes. the Congo kings amassed through their steel was legendary. They lived in palaces surrounded by ivory, the silver of South America, the gold of Mexico, the silks of China, the craftworks of Arabia, and spices of India. Their yeah, the archaeology is amazing uh, when you see that. Same with the East African. Because of these trade agreements, you find, you know, Chinese silk, for example, spices out of Southeast, how wealthy they were. Incredible. Ambassadors were. But again, all of this came with a, uh, what do you want to say, a time limit, because when Europeans stopped doing the slave trade there, um, a lot of these European uh, states are going to, of course, practice economic imperialism, especially, you know, uh, about the mid 1800s. When Africa, with the scramble for Africa, nearly the entire continent will be exploited um, by European power, some kind. Guests of honor throughout the many kingdoms of Europe, and you can still see their portraits in national galleries in Portugal to this day. But you can only see their portraits in Portugal and some in Brazil. So where are the Congo kings now? The Congo Later, kings were part of the Belgians. first modern economy, but because of the part they played, they never modernized themselves. The Portuguese introduced the Congo kings to technologies such as navigation, the wheel, the plow, and printing, but the Congo kings never adopted these technologies. There was simply no reason to do There's so. No need to. The entire economy was built around kidnapping and selling Africans into slavery. There was no need to plow fields and con and an economic lesson you should get when taking a human geography course or just an economics course is it is bad for an economy to be dependent on one right because if that one thing fails you have nothing else to do and later on when it's really the era of european imperialism africa that's what happened to the, those those colonies and that was because they were forced to as well it was like they were designed to be have resources extracted from them not bring infrastructure to those colonies. Conduct investments in agriculture. No need to build ships and sail to places. No reason to build carts that exported goods on land. And no reason to print books. But I do there need was, to however, stress that the imported European, European technology, which the Congo kings did this adopt very quickly and used to its fullest effect. The gun. Equipped with these Muskets. guns and learning to make them and use them, the slave raids became even more efficient at kidnapping Africans to sell into slavery. But also yeah, to slavery, if you look at um, the amount of slaves it, uh, that were transferred, you look at the chart and it goes up over very, uh, very high. And in fact, in fact, in a lot of um, in this time period, in the 1800s, where most of these European states were banning slavery, were some of the highest numbers of slaves being taken out of Africa. Because, again, it becomes so efficient with, you know, semi-industrial, you know, level of uh, technology that you can or conquering. Violently subdue competition and assert control over the slave economy, pretty good so thereby far. increasingly destabilizing the region. The economy became built around the institution of slavery in its entirety. The Congo kings even manipulated markets to increase their output, holding back on selling slaves during the Caribbean harvest season to artificially hike up the prices and then sell more like at the country ball profit. stuff. But through the economy being entirely built around slavery, slavery also began to deeply impact society and political structures. 
The Congo Kingdom was an absolute monarchy, with an aristocracy that acted as the governors of the regions. By the 1560s, the monarchy also became hereditary. We're Nevertheless, the laws the of the kingdom century. had always been you whatever be the king wanted them to be. Taxation was therefore completely arbitrary. New taxes were enforced whenever the king wanted to take something from someone or for other weird reasons. There was a tax that had to be paid for every time the king's hat fell from his head. This arbitrary what? nature of governance disincentivized any really? further investment or innovation in economic sectors outside of slavery. Why invest in plows and build on agriculture when the king can just take away whatever you built on a whim? Those who displeasured the king found themselves crazy. dispossessed and sold into slavery with their entire families. I mean, you're all, you all can see now why once the slave trade's banned, what this is going to do to the country. They're, they have nothing. They have nothing to operate them. The economy is totally um, going to make them vulnerable and very difficult to compete in a growing world. Through slavery, an authoritarian state became even more authoritarian, and society became more reclusive. Ironically, as state power centralized within the figure of the king, society decentralized. Aristocrats and peoples moved away from the cities, moved as far away from roads Probably as possible more. to be as far away Local as lords. possible from the slave trade as to not fall victims themselves to it or to its arbitrary and violent nature or victims to the arbitrarily enacted absolute power of those who controlled it. West Africa deurbanized, fragmented into segments. And while the remaining participants in the global National economy Saudi that Arabia's slavery fueled managed to modernize and innovate through the development of other sectors, the Congo Kingdom, the very source of that fuel, stagnated and decayed. When slavery was abolished by the Congo Kingdom's customers, the Congo state collapsed. Various little aristocratic statelets emerged in a continuous violent struggle with each other over what was left. Now, I don't know if we'll get to this, but just to, just to make note, because it is a, it's an important future context here, is um, with the Congo, specifically, like what today is the Congo, very um, a lot of these dealings are doing more with the but that is going to be brutally colonized by the country that actually started off the scramble of Africa in the 18th century, uh, Belgium, not Portugal. King Leopold. The practice of raiding your neighbors, kidnapping their people, and stealing their wealth continued, only this time within the kingdom itself. Banditry Lapse basically everywhere. became its main source of income. Although the kingdom continued to exist in name up into the 20th century, it was by the 1800s little more than a selection of constantly feuding warlords who, when French colonial officers arrived, had no means to put up a unified resistance against colonization. The last of the Congo kings was made a powerless vassal of the Portuguese, while the rest of his lands were carved up between the French and Belgians. When the Congolese rebelled in 1914, the Portuguese crushed the World rebellion and made the lands part of the Angola colony. Amplified by colonial rule, the disarray and decay which slavery wrought upon these lands still ravage it to this day. The Congo is a place unable to centralize, unable to unite, unable to remove foreign dominion and exploitation of its resources and peoples. Yeah, it's unfortunate. You can see, you know, a lot of people, of course, are ignorant. Like, I get this across with my because what they think about Africa, they asked about Africa, you know, think, like, first off, they may know nothing or are like, isn't it poor? Isn't it violent and all that stuff? And those kind of questions, you know, they're important, but like there are answers to them. And you can see with Africa, actually how recent the events are that have led to Africa and many parts of Africa, you know, being... Being, being very, very difficult to, I don't know if you want to call it catch up to the rest of the world or whatever, because it was intentionally, you know, exploited where once they do eventually get their independence, a lot of them, you know, okay, you see these uh, happening around World War I. Many of them, it wasn't until decades even after World War II. And their independence, yes, that's great, but they were left with no infrastructure to actually build a country. So to kind of catch up, it's been very, very difficult. Some countries have been able to do it better than others. I remember, too, that some of these um, colonies were able to get their independence through peaceful measures. Places like Ghana, um, 
where, you know, because of that, we're able to, you know, get going faster. But then there's other places that had to do it, you know, by war or there was a civil war after. And that has just pushed the development further back. So now you can see when we have this, you know, huge amounts of, of differences and like whatever you want to call development in the world, there's always an answer for that. And this is one of those, this is the reason here for Africa. And compounded by legacies of colonialism, continues to be ravaged by civil wars, exploitation, anarchy, and poverty. Nothing remains of the legendary wealth of the Congo kings. Saudi Arabia, though? On the 14th of February 1945, the USS Quincy sailed into the Suez Canal. On board was the US here. President Roosevelt. Dying with only weeks left to live, he had yeah. still come personally to he conduct a meeting that he believed was essential to the future of the United States and the development of a global economy <laughs> that could stand up to the Soviets after the Second World War. He met with King Abdulaziz ibn Saud on the ship, and the two men okay. struck a deal. The we'll see Saudis what this has to do would provide with access to their oil fields to sell oil to the United States and its European and Asian allies. The United States and Saudi Arabia are still allies. Mostly because of, again, oil, having a military presence. In Everyone obviously could understand how, how important the Middle East is going to be you know, for major world powers to be able to get oil from. In exchange, the United States would provide military aid and secure the defense of Saudi Arabia of against all its enemies. The hydrocarbons of Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Kuwait, Oman, and Qatar would be the fuel burnt to build the global economy of the 20th century. The kings of Arabia would gain almost fantastical wealth through this trade. The richest people they lived in, the world. in palaces surrounded by all the luxuries of the modern age. But none of them Insane. have innovated or created any economic sectors outside of hydrocarbons. Their palaces are built by foreigners. Yeah. Their luxuries are made by foreigners and imported by foreigners. Their enormous they're contractors. Um, here's a here's a great example in in Saudi Arabia of a family that an, an, um, <coughs> benefited enormously from like American oil. Um, was a family that was a construction company in Saudi Arabia. You know. Um, Places to uh, to manufacture oil or not manufacture, find it, build that. That was the Bin Laden family. Yes, Osama Bin Laden. Um, they were billionaires by getting contracts for the United States in oil production and things like that in um, Saudi Arabia. So they got a lot of contracts. So that's where that money was going. Of course, there's some irony with that, right? Of supporting that family and specifically Osama, who was very much unlike the uh, was unlike the rest of his family members, but. Y'all understand. Wealth is used to bribe the poorer neighbors into submission and thereby stagnate political okay, development I see throughout the, the entire region. They control the hydrocarbon market ruthlessly, manipulating prices to ensure their own wealth, but also to crush outside competition. Yeah, I want to do this because, you know, it's, it's wrapping up here in a minute and a half. Um, I believe the thesis here is that Saudi Arabia is going to be doomed because they are completely dependent on foreign um, uh, purchasing of Saudi Arabian oil. And that what will happen to Saudi Arabia is what happened, like he was saying, to those Africans. Right? That once slavery was ended, their countries collapsed, that Saudi Arabia will be. It's a fair point, especially as society is trying to move, you know, however slowly, away from fossil fuels. That eventually that may happen, and then, then, then what is it for Saudi Arabia? So, the long way, he's done a really long, if that's the, the thesis here, which I'm getting at, is it's, it's taken a long time, basically like 90% of the video, to set up a thesis and, and set up a, a, an analysis here that will be, it looks like, explained in less than two minutes out of the 14-minute video. There's nothing being manufactured or any technologies being adopted and further invested upon or innovated There's upon. Some interesting the only innovation on they were so they all quick and happy to embrace were the weapons the Americans provided, which they used to bully all those who displeased them into line. And the Saudi Arabia is not well liked by a lot of people because they've dealt with the West so much. Yeah. Stabilized the region for the arming and financing of various death squads. 
Their political systems are absolute, authoritarian, archaic and stagnant. And the enormous wealth they gained only made those systems more absolute, authoritarian, archaic and stagnant. The big criticism that people have of the United the laws States, they enforce are they support arbitrary. countries that, Civil liberties are an alien concept like and whatever wealth Arabia you build can be taken from you at any given moment people, if a king should wish it. Consequently, whatever part substantial of investments what are made by citizens are almost entirely bunkered abroad. Those who displeasure the king are banished, disappear into dungeons, or are outright murdered. Civil society has consequently retreated into private homes under a social contract that guarantees that they will be left alone as long as they do so. A public civil society or public space does consequently not exist. Civil society is therefore fractured and decentralized with a deep distrust of everyone, mm. while the state remains all-powerful and centralized as long as it continues to run on the money made for hydrocarbons. If they keep running on hydrocarbons, the future of Saudi Arabia and the Arab Gulf states is to be the next Congo. Okay. A fair point. Okay, I do have some final thoughts. Don't go anywhere. Okay, so first thing I wanted to comment on was kind of the structure of the video. Because... I mean, yes, it was titled Why Saudi Arabia is Doomed, but it was kind of interesting that like 90% of the video was about, you know, the African slave trade and not that it had a connection to Saudi Arabian development very directly, but just using it as an example. I mean, for this example, Saudi Arabia didn't need to even be anywhere, you know, near the re or near Africa. But um but it's the idea that you could see that it was about becoming so reliant on one system. Now, an interesting part, though, is like those, a lot of those African states, um, I was saying earlier that the Europeans didn't necessarily have the power to really like conquer a whole state. Like Portugal couldn't have done that with um, Congolese ki uh, kingdoms or Angolan kingdoms, anything like that. But um, they also had, there was an element of those, those people in Africa, though, kind of being almost forced into this because you know you by conducting the slave trade you were in a way protecting yourself from being the ones enslaved so i think there was a matter of that of like i don't want to fully say that like those those african nations didn't have a choice but it definitely made the choice easier right to to side with the Euro Saudi arabia maybe not as much but they were a very much aware you know, going back to like when pretty much Arabia got its got its independence from um, the Ottoman Empire, um, being able to realize that its future very much lies in oil because it's the one thing and only thing they could really produce that the world needs. Seeing again how they've adopted that, but maybe it's more of a, a warning for Saudi Arabia that they're going to need to find other ways to be productive. Right, outside of that, because he didn't really say, though, like, you know, anything about that the future is pretty much set up that there's going to be a movement away from oil. And again, oil producing nations, um, say like the Middle East, are going to have a struggle with, you know, finding another way to survive. But yeah, but the structure of the video is interesting. I don't think it needed I th all of that African slave trade stuff. I, I feel like that story could have been um, or could have been summarized way way shorter and then i would actually like to hear more about like what saudi arabia is exactly doing more parallels with the african slave trade other than just being you know okay eventually you know saudi arabia because they won't be you know or they won't people aren't gonna need their oil are gonna be gone but like i don't know i'd like to see more parallels it kind of just used one point to support the thesis there i'd like to see other things and really again compare use of oil to use of slavery because i think you could do that a lot it would make for like a great essay this is my teacher brain going on these are like the feedback comments i would have put if this was turned this whole video was turned in as a paper like for a, a class that maybe had a thesis like an ap um essay where it's like you know compare and contrast economic developments in you know, the 20th century versus an economic development, the 16th century. But anyway, but as far as like the content, that was great. I loved, that was really good. Well told about the, the slave trade stuff. 
yeah I, again i just thought that i found the structure kind of interesting interesting there and maybe didn't flow as well in fact you know it this probably would have been better suited as just saying uh, something some kind of you know title having to do more with with the slave trade than actually saudi arabia I mean, I, I don't want to tell crap what to do. This video in nine months has over a million views. So, but to maybe catch the eyes of other people. But I don't know. Maybe if you have seen this before, would this video have caught your eye more if the title was something about the slave trade? Or did you come to the original video if you've seen this because it was Saudi Arabia? Actually, be interested to hear that. Let me know down in the comments. Anyway, uh, thanks a lot for hanging out with me again. Thanks to Kraut again. Uh, when I contacted him about his channel, he was very uh, supportive of the idea of me commenting on it. So I absolutely appreciate that. And with that, we'll see you all next time. Bye.